Iceberg Ahoy! We're going to cross the icy Atlantic and retrace the paces of this famous yet fateful mighty mass of a ship. This baffling behemoth never made it past its maiden voyage. All aboard! Full steam ahead! Set sail with us as we sink our teeth into the tragic story of the Titanic on today's FYI. Welcome to For Your Info. English. You got it. You got it. Hello, 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 my amigos, and welcome to another exciting edition of FYI for your Inglés, the topic-based show that comes out every week, and we delve into a different topic and teach you English along the way. And as I always say, I hope you're learning so much more than just English on this show. Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, si no habéis averiguado, today we're going to look at the mighty Titanic. And mighty means big and strong. That's one of the words we looked at in our intro. So why don't we go over and start where we always start with the intro or the introduction. I started off by saying iceberg ahoy. And iceberg is a word that you all know because, well, you say iceberg but we pronounce it iceberg. And the word ahoy, maybe that word looks familiar. Are you familiar with chips ahoy? Chips ahoy, you know those famous chocolate chip cookies? I mean, is there any better than chips ahoy? And I'm not getting paid by chips ahoy. But did you guys know that that's a play on words? Es un juego de palabra. Chips ahoy. Que hay barcos a la vista. El ahoy es a la vista. So that's why I said iceberg ahoy. Iceberg a la vista. And a very interesting thing about this ahoy, this almost became our telephone greeting. Now it's very normal. You pick up the phone and you say, hello, who's calling? You know, it's very normal to say hello or hey. Nobody says ahoy, hoy. Well, if Alexander Graham Bell had gotten his way, si hubiese salido con la suya, this Scottish-born inventor uh, would have had everyone answering the phone saying, Ahoy, hoy, as the standard greeting. Well, it's a good thing good taste prevailed. La buen, el buen gusto, no? Then in the intro, I said we're going to cross the icy Atlantic. And obviously, icy is the adjective for very cold or something containing ice. And the Atlantic, well, is the ocean that separates Europe and the United States. Ocean. Let's pronounce that word together. Ocean. Because that C sounds like an SH. The Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Then I said we're going to retrace the paces. And to retrace is volver sobre los pasos. Rememorar. Recordar. To retrace the paces. Los pasos. You can also say the steps. But I thought I liked the sound of retrace the paces of this famous yet fateful. Now, I know you know the word famous. Just be careful with the pronunciation. It's not famous or famous. It's famous. Famous. Remember, guys, these podcasts can be much more than a listening exercise. If you repeat the vocabulary that I'm looking at, especially the more complicated ones, aloud. And the word fateful means catastrophic, uh, ominous, prophetic. We use this word a lot when we're describing disasters. That fateful night, that fateful day. And then I said, this mighty mass of a ship. I already taught you the word mighty earlier. It's big and strong, powerful. This mighty mass, masa, of a ship. And the word ship is a really good word, but don't say sheep, because sheep is bah. Yeah, ship, ship versus sheep. And remember, the word ship is also mandar. So if we ship something to another country, lo estamos mandando, enviando. But whatever you do, don't pronounce it sheep. It's 
ship. And remember, you can have a ship on the ocean. You can have an airship in the air. So this idea of ship is not exclusively for the sea. Then I said this baffling behemoth. Now there's that alliteration. Baffling is confusing, mystifying. You know, when you look at it, you're like, wow, I don't get it. This baffling behemoth, and I love the word behemoth. The word behemoth is something huge. It is monstruo, gigante, bestia de la tierra, you know? And I think that's a great way to describe this ship. This baffling behemoth never made it past its maiden voyage. And its maiden voyage is its first voyage. Fijaos en la pronunciación, no es voyage, it's voyage, que rima con bridge. It's maiden voyage. Then I said, all aboard, which I'm sure you know, todos, a bordo. And then we heard that foghorn. Lately, I've been using that sound effect a lot. Well, I, I like the sound of the foghorn, that deep... And next up, I taught you a really good idiomatic expression. Full steam ahead, o también se puede decir full speed ahead, which means a todo gas. And if you think about it, these were steam ships, se movían con vapor, so it makes sense. And I wrapped up the intro saying, set sail with us. Zarpar, I think, is to set sail, emprender un viaje. Set sail with us as we sink our teeth into, hincarle el diente, the tragic story of the Titanic, the RMS Titanic. Remember, we don't pronounce it Titanic. In English, it's Titanic, if you haven't noticed yet. And what is that RMS thing? Why do they call it RMS Titanic? Well, it was because it was called the Royal Mail Ship. And that was one of the things that we'll talk about was on the Titanic, aside from passengers and not very many lifeboats. But so many ships stand out. You know, there are a lot of famous ships, the Lusitania, but I think no ship on earth stands out like the Titanic. It's in a class all by itself. I mean, it was huge, literally speaking, when it came out. I mean, now it's compared to the cruise liners, it's not very big. But it was huge when it came out, but it continues to be huge. And when I mean huge there, I mean enorme, que todo el mundo habla de este tema. Everybody talks about the Titanic. We're fascinated by it. We're spellbound. We can't stop talking about it. I know when I was researching this episode, it was a lot of fun. I really loved looking into the Titanic. So what's the deal? What's this fascination? You know, why is everybody so fascinated by the Titanic? Was it because it was the largest moving thing on Earth when it launched? Or was it because it was supposedly unsinkable? Hmm. Or maybe because they were tempting fate. As many of you know, they said, this thing cannot be sunk. And we're going to go as fast as we can go and icebergs won't affect us. So maybe, you know, it was that classic idea in Greek tragedy, la tragedia griega, called hubris. Hubris, que es orgullo excesivo. And it is the downfall of, of mankind in many, many stories in Greek tragedy. And even uh, to this day, if you look at a movie such as Scarface, El Precio del Poder, it's about hubris. A guy who has nothing, he gets everything, and then he becomes excessively proud. And his pride gets the best of him. So maybe it was the hubris that was involved. Maybe it was the fact that it was on its maiden voyage. Or maybe it's because some of the most important socialites of the time were on board. People such as John Jacob Astor IV, Margaret Brown, or as they call her, the unsinkable Molly Brown. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, the movie, which in the movie that was played by the, the unsinkable Kathy Bates. And we're going to talk about in the bonus part of the show how the movie got some things right, what it got wrong, and all kinds of other interesting interesting facts.
If you'd like access to the bonus content every week, or you want to have vocabulary and worksheets that accompany every episode, well then consider joining us on Patreon. That's right, you can join us. We're over at patreon.com slash Alberto Alonso, and we've got a great group of curious cats. Cats is a way we say gente, no? Pájaros, maybe you would say in Spanish, who are learning and laughing with me every week. If you want to join our curious community, Go over to patreon.com slash Alberto Alonso and find out more. And if you want a free sample, just contact me. I'd be more than happy to give you one. And remember, follow me on social media if you're not doing so, because I'm always teaching new things and concepts every day on my social media. But right now, it's time for a shout out to all my patrons, especially my super duper students, Francisco, Sabela, Tony, Roberto. Jose Maria, Mila, Alex, Patricio, Edgar, Loles, and don't forget about my interstellar students, Carmen, Pilar, Diego, and Diana. So let's get back into the Titanic now. That's what we came here to talk about today. And remember, if you guys have the PDFs, if you are patrons, remember to use them. Remember to follow along, and this way you don't miss all the vocabulary. And if you guys are higher level, well, you can try and fill in the vocabulary. To fill in is rellenar. All right, so where did it all start? When did they come up with the idea to build the largest ship ever? ever. The largest moving thing ever. Well, it happened, like many meetings, over dinner. That's right. A nice dinner among friends. Among is entre, pero cuando tenemos más de dos puntos de referencia. So I I live between these two cities, but I live among other cities cuando hay más de dos puntos. So this guy, Bruce Ismay. Bruce Ismay, you probably know from the movie. He's the guy, I guess you could say it was his brainchild. Your brainchild is a very fancy way of saying your idea. And he sat down with his brother-in-law, a guy named Carlisle. And Ismay worked for the White Star Cruise Line. That was the one that had the Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic, and, well, other ships at the time. However, they had cutthroat competition. Cutthroat competition is very, very competitive. And that was from the Cunard Line. The Cunard Line, they were the ones that owned the Mauritania and the Lusitania. They were also the ones who held the record for the fastest Atlantic crossing. And that was a big thing back then. Which ship could cross the Atlantic the fastest? And these guys were killing it. They, The Cunard Line, they were fast. They found a way to make it fast. And they could cross the Atlantic in four or five days. And White Star, Titanic's brand, they couldn't keep up. So then Bruce... Bruce Ismay, the guy who became infamous in the end, he had a really good idea. As much as I don't like him, and he's usually portrayed as a bad guy in this story, he did have a good idea. He said, if we can't beat them at their game, which is speed, we've got to have our own game. We've got to make our own rules. And they decided to focus on opulence, on luxury, on size, instead of speed. And, well... Does that sound familiar? It sounds like the birth of the modern cruise industry. Now, I don't know much about cruises, but isn't that the idea? These big, luxurious things with so much to do, and speed is not really the idea. The idea is to cruise around. And that's a great word, by the way. The word cruise is pasear. So you shouldn't be going fast. You should be enjoying it. Now, I've never been on a cruise, but I can imagine that you want to take your time, especially if you're in the Bahamas or something like that. And if you noticed, I said to go on a cruise. Remember, when you guys learn a new word, don't just learn to go. Don't learn the word cruise, for example. You have to learn the verb to go on a a cruise, ir de crucero. So let's take a, uh, a look at some of the stats, you know, some of the statistics, as we call them, of the Titanic. How tall was she? Now, I know what you're thinking. Why do you keep saying she? It's an inanimate object. Well, you can ask a captain if his ship is an inanimate object and 
they will all say, no, it isn't. She is this. So this is because we personify things. We like to give things human qualities. So how tall was this behemoth? I put everything in meters. I originally had it in feet, but since many of you listen from Europe, I put it in meters. She was 53.3 meters tall. That's huge. Her length. So how long was she? Longitude, we say length. But the question is, how long was the ship? It was, or she was, as we refer to her, 269.1 meters long. Acuérdate, nosotros decimos, decimos punto uno, no coma uno. And the width, the width is envergadura, I think you say. How wide was this ship? She was 28 meters wide. Now, as we said before, she wasn't the fastest ship in the world, but she had a speed of 22 knots, a top speed of 22 knots. And the translation, for those of you who don't know, those propellers, elithis, could produce 30,000 horsepower. The only problem is they were moving something that was, you know, bigger than most buildings. And speaking of building... About 14,000 people, according to the figures I looked at, 14,000 people built the Titanic and worked on her. And sadly, eight of those people died. They never made it out. So maybe you could even say that was some foreshadowing of the, the tragedy to come, the trauma to come. And to foreshadow is presagiar, no? Anunciar. It's a, it's a writing technique that a lot of people use. Now, the ship had nine decks. So on a ship, we call cada planta, cada nivel, a deck. So she had nine decks. And there were first class, second class, and third class cabins. There were 416 first class cabins. There were 162 second class cabins and 262 third class cabins. So that's a whole lot of people on board, not to mention the cargo. There were cars and then you needed the provisions, the food and drink for all of these people. I mean, if you want to study big numbers, take a look at the Titanic's statistics. I mean, just her anchor, anchoress, el ancla, was 5.63 meters, 5.63 metros. That is incredible. You can find some pictures of it online with humans sitting next to it, and <laughs> they look like ants, hormigas. So let's talk a little bit now about her maiden voyage. She set off, to set off is emprender, empezar algo. She set off after leaving Southampton on April 10th. Now the year is 1912. Now a lot of people don't talk about this, but she had a little mini stop on the way in Cherbourg in France. And then Queenstown in Ireland. So a couple different stops that a lot of times we don't mention. I imagine they weren't mentioned in the movie because the movie already lasted three hours. The place I just told you, Queenstown, is not called Queenstown anymore. So if you look it up on a map, you'll have to look it up as Cobe with an H at the end. Cobe in Ireland. And then once it hit Cobe, Ireland, it was time to cross the Atlantic to her final destination, New York City, the New World. America. I mean, it was perfect. Everything was great. This was the new ship, brand new, or as we say, brand spanking new. Celebrities on board. I mean, a who's who of everybody who was famous. And the whole world was paying attention as she set out to cross the Atlantic. And on top of it, además, there were smooth seas. The sea was calm. It wasn't choppy. Choppy is removido. It was a, a moonless night as well. So it was calm. You know, uh, the, the only thing I can think of is the calm before the storm. Then on April 14th, four days into her Atlantic crossing, about 600 kilometers south of Newfoundland in Canada, she hit an iceberg. And I think that part of the story everybody knows. This was 11.40 p.m. Uh, this is the ship's time. And imagine how dark it was. It was a moonless night. It was still. You just heard the sounds of panic, of distress when she hit that iceberg. 
And you want to know the worst part? She got six warnings. Her radio guys got six warnings over their wireless system telling them, hey, guys, there's a lot of uh, iceberg activity out in the Atlantic. And six times they warned them. They tried to warn them. And in fact, one of the times the radio operator said, would you please shut up? He told him to shut up. And it wasn't because he didn't want to hear the bad news. It's because he was busy. They had other things to tend to. They didn't want their radio lines to be blocked up. They wanted their passengers to be able to send wireless messages on their Marconi grams. So as many of you guys know, there was the, the Marconi connection. The famous radio inventor Marconi had something to do with the Titanic and her communication system. So they also used it not just for distress signals, which was the ultimate use in the end, but to send digital postcards from the center of the Atlantic. So the radio operator said, Guy, enough. I don't care about the ice. I'm busy. I got to get Mr. Guggenheim's postcard out before morning. So there's a, a really good trivia question. The Titanic had wireless, <laughs> not Wi-Fi internet, but they had wireless communication. Thanks, Marconi. I don't think anybody will debate the fact that the iceberg had something to do with the sinking. But there are a lot of other things I realized, a lot of other factors that went into play. And I realized this as somebody who loves aviation. It's never just one thing. It's not that simple. It is a chain of events. Yes, they hit an iceberg, but uh, they were going fast. Yeah, now there's two elements, but also the rivets. You guys remember we looked at the word rivets. Those are the little metal bolts that keep the boat together. Well, what if I told you that the metal was faulty? A rivet is a uh, remache. Yeah, the rivets had something called slag residue. I don't know uh, very much about metals, but it had something called slag residue, which made it faulty, and faulty is defectuoso, and that contributed to the weakness of the Titanic. So maybe if those rivets have been had been made stronger, well, maybe it would have been able to absorb the impact. Also, if, if many of you guys remember from the movie, they talk about the compartment. So it had a lot of different compartments. The only problem was once more than four of those compartments were flooded, then they couldn't guarantee that she would stay afloat. And what happened? Well, more than four flooded. And that's when the designers and some of the White Star people knew that the, the ship that was unsinkable was going down and fast. In fact, it only took 160 minutes for the ocean, the, the icy Atlantic, to swallow the Titanic whole. Another thing that blew my mind when I was preparing this was that there was a fire on board the Titanic. Now, I know you're thinking, what? A fire? Yeah. Yeah. And it was a fire that was burning for days. And the fire started before they even left. As you guys know, these ships ran on coal, carbon. And these tanks where they kept them, well, these were these huge, huge tanks. And there was a fire burning in one of them. And that fire kept burning. And there was no way to put it out. They tried and tried, and they could not put it out. To put out es apagar. So they made an executive decision to keep on going. The show must go on, regardless of this fire. After all, this is the Titanic. This is just a little fire. It's not going to weaken this ginormous ship. Well, guess again. It did. And I saw some pictures. I'll share a documentary with you guys on Patreon, if you'd like, where there are pictures that show that when the ship was boarding and everything, there was this mark. This mark, which looked like it was burned or weakened, and it's the exact same spot where the Titanic hit the iceberg. So was the fire the cause? No. But could the fire have weakened the structure? Well, you bet. Claro que sí. When the ship sank, she snapped in half. To snap is another way to say to break in half. And in the bonus part of the show today, we're going to take a look at all the different parts of a ship as well. But if you recall from the movie The Stern, the back of the boat lifted up in the air violently, and then it started to bob a little bit. To bob is to go boom, boom, boom. 
kind of like to bounce in the water. And then just about the moment she started sinking, it took five to 10 minutes for her to reach the bottom of the sea. So 160 minutes to sink and about five or 10 minutes to reach her final resting place where she is today. And she's been there ever since and she may be there forever. And we're going to talk about that in the bonus part of the show too, because forever, well, then somebody's got to protect her because remember, this is ocean water and this is metal. And well, they're predicting, ah, I won't tell you yet. I'll wait till the bonus part. More than 1,500 lives were lost on that fateful day, as we said before. And that was two thirds of the 2,228 people that were on board at the time of the tragedy. And many of them drowned, to drown is ahogarse. Many of them froze to death. I mean, even if you managed to get off the ship, once you were in that water, I mean, you had six to 12 minutes to live. That was, that was frigid water. In fact, I looked at the temperature. It was supposedly 2.7 degrees below zero Celsius. So, menos dos coma siete centigrado. 2.7 below zero Celsius. That is frigid. And as we know, there weren't enough lifeboats for everybody on board. They had life jackets, of course, and, well, they didn't have enough for everybody either, but these were made of cork, very different than the life jackets today. But even more famous than the life jackets was the lifeboats. According to the figures I looked up here, 64 was the original plan. They planned to have 64 lifeboats. But they decided, aesthetically, that they could only fit 33. Yeah, they didn't want the deck to look too cluttered. And when something is cluttered, it means there's a lot going on. And out of those 33, they ended up with only 20. And only 18 of those were launched. And we know who ended up in those. Well, obviously, women and children first, and millionaires. Well, folks, we've reached the end of the first part of today's FYI. But remember, there's a bonus part and you can get so much more if you join us on Patreon. Again, it's patreon.com slash Alberto Alonso. We're going to look at the wreck of the Titanic. We'll also look at the Carpathia and the Californian, two ships that were nearby. We'll also talk about some people who almost boarded the Titanic, but changed their mind at the last minute. Plus, we'll take a look at a novel that was written 14 years before the Titanic, and there are some striking similarities. We'll also look at other ways to say huge parts of a ship and conspiracy theories. Oh, and some idioms too. All that in the bonus part of today's show. If you'd like to join us, consider becoming a patron or just ask me and I'll send you the bonus content so you could take a look or give it a listen, I should say. And I guess wrapping up, like all accidents, we hope we learned something from it. We hope there was a lesson, a takeaway, as we say. And I think there is. There is a lesson because after that day, it changed the regulations of lifeboats and all the safety measures associated with ships. So to end on a positive note, thanks to that horrible tragedy, shipping, going on cruises, and even fishing became just a little bit more safe. And we're going to say goodbye to this episode right now, this first part of the episode, with the song that the orchestra was playing as the Titanic sank. The song is called Nearer My God to Thee. Más cerca mi Dios, mi Señor, a usted. Hmm, pretty freaky, huh? Da miedo. Thanks so much for joining us in this episode of FYI.